I'm going to ask a question where you can only answer by saying either yes, no, or it's complicated. <laughs> All right? So let's we'll, we'll start over here. Is some form of superintelligence possible? Jan? <laughs> yes, no, or it's complicated? Yes. 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 <coughs> yes. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was disappointing. We didn't find any disagreements. Um, let's try harder. Uh, just because it's possible doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. So, so before I asked if superintelligence is possible at all, according to the laws of physics, now I'm asking, will it actually happen? Yes, no, or it's complicated? A little bit complicated, but yes. Uh, yes, and if it doesn't, something terrible has happened to prevent it. Like when it yeah. Yes. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yes. 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 No. <laughs> <laughs> Shucks, still haven't found any interesting disagreements. We need to try, try harder still. Okay. So you think it is going to happen, but would you actually like it to happen at some point? Yes, no, or it's complicated. Complicated leaning towards yes. It's complicated. Yes. Yes. It's really complicated. <laughs> yes. It's complicated. Very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on which kind. All right. So, so it's getting a little bit more interested. When I think we, we had a really fascinating, when is this going to happen? Well, we had a really fascinating discussion already in in this morning's panel about when we might get to human level AI. So that would sort of put a lower bound. I don't, in the interest of time, I, I think we don't need to rehash the question of when going beyond that might start. But, but let's ask a very related question to the one that just came up here. Namely, the, the question of, um, well, if something starts to happen, if you get some sort of recursive self-improvement or some other process whereby intelligence start and machines starts to take off very, very rapidly, there's always a time scale associated with this. And there, I hope we can finally find some real serious disagreements to argue about here. Uh, some people have been envisioning this scenario where it goes, foom, and things happen in days or hours or less, whereas others envision that it will happen, but it might take thousands of years or decades. So if you think of some sort of doubling time, or some, or some sort of rough time scale on which things get dramatically better, what time? What time would you? What time scale would you guess at, Jan? Starting now or starting with human level? No, no. So, so once we get to human level AI and, and or, or whatever point beyond there or a little bit before there, where those of you, where where things actually start taking off, what is this sort of time scale? Uh, any explosion uh, as a nerdy physicist has some sort of time scale, right, on w which it happens. Are we talking about seconds or years or millennia? I'm thinking of years, uh, but uh, but it's important to act as if this uh, timeline was shorter. Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually don't really trust my intuitions here. I have intuitions that we're thinking of years, but um, I, th I also think human level AI is a mirage. It's going to be suddenly better than human, but whether, whether that's going to be a full intelligence explosion quickly, I don't know. Um, I, think, I think it partly depends on the architecture that ends up delivering human-level AI. So um, it's the kind of neuroscience-inspired AI that we seem to be building at the moment that needs to be trained and have experience and other things to gain knowledge. There may, you know, it may be on the order of two years, so possibly even a decade. I think it's some numbers of years, are, but it could also be much less. But I would be surprised if it was much more. Yeah, potentially days or shorter, especially if it's AI researchers designing AI researchers. Uh, every time there's an advance in AI, we dismiss it as, oh, well, that's not really AI, chess, go, self-driving cars. And AI, as you know, is the field of things we haven't done yet. 
That'll continue when we actually reach AGI. There'll be lots of controversy. By the time the controversy settles down, we'll realize that it's been around for a few years. Yeah, so, so related. I think we'll, we'll you know, go beyond human capabilities in many different areas, but not in all at the same time. So um, it, it will be an uneven process where some areas will be far advanced very soon uh, already to some extent and others might take much longer. What Bart said. <laughs> but I think if it re reaches the threshold where it's as, as smart as the smartest, most inventive human, then, uh, I mean, it really could be, I mean, a matter of days before it's smarter than the sum of humanity. So here we saw quite an interesting range of, of answers. And this, I, th I, I find, a v is a very interesting question because for reasons that people here have published a lot of interesting papers about, the time scale makes a huge difference, right? If it's something that's happening on the time scale of the Industrial Revolution, for example, that's a lot more sh longer than the time scale on which society can adapt and take measures to steer the development, you borrowing your nice rocket metaphor, Jan. Whereas if things happen much quicker than then society can respond, it's much harder to steer and you kind of have to hope that you've built in a good steering in advance. So in, in for example, nuclear reactors, we, we nerdy physicists like to stick graphite sticks in as moderators to sort of slow things down and maybe even <coughs> prevent it from going critical. Uh, I'm curious if any of one of you feels that it would be nice if, if uh, this growth of intelligence, which you're generally excited about, with some caveats, if, if any of you would like to have it happen a bit slower, so it becomes easier for society to keep shaping it the way we want it, and if so, and here's a tough question, is there anything we could do now or, or later on when it, when, it, when it gets closer that might make this intelligence explosion or rapid growth of intelligence simply proceed slower so we can have more, we can have more influence over it? Does anyone want to take a swing at this? It's not for a, a whole panel, but anyone who... Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, of the conversation we had with uh, Rick, uh, Rich Sutton uh, in Puerto Rico. Like, we had a lot of disagreements, but definitely we could agree about, uh, about slow and be, being better than, than faster. Any, any thoughts about how we, we one could make it a little bit slower? Well, I mean, the strategy I suggested in my talk was somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but it was also serious. I, uh, I think this conference is great, and as technologists, we should do everything we can to keep the technology uh, safe and, uh, and beneficial. Uh, and certainly, as we do each specific application, like self-driving cars, there's a whole host of ethical issues to address. But I don't think we can solve the problem uh, just technologically. You imagine that we've done our job perfectly, and we've created you know, the most safe, beneficial AI possible, but we've let the political system become totalitarian and evil, either a world, evil world government or even just a portion of the globe uh, that, that's that, that is that way. It's not going to work out well. And so part of the uh, struggle is in the area of politics and social policy to, to, to have the world reflect the values we want to achieve. because. We're talking about human AI. Human yeah. AI is, by definition, at human levels, and therefore is human. And so the issue of how do we make humans ethical is the same issue as how we make uh, AIs that are human level ethical. Yeah, so w what I'm hearing you say is that before we reach the point of, of getting close to human level AI, a, a very good way to prepare for that is for us humans and our human society to try to get our act together as much as possible and have the world run with more reason than, than it perhaps is today. Is that fair? That's exactly what I'm saying. Nick? Also, I just want to clarify again that when I asked about slow, what, how, what you would do to slow things down, I'm not talking at all about slowing down AI research now. We're simply talking about if we get to the <coughs> point that we're getting very near human level AI and think we might get some very, very fast development, <coughs> how could one slow that part down? <coughs> so one method yeah. would be to make faster progress now so you get to that point sooner when hardware is less developed you get less hardware overhang um, however the current speed of AI progress is a fairly hard variable to change very much because there are big forces pushing on it 
So perhaps the higher elasticity option is what I suggested in the talk to ensure that whoever gets there first has enough of a lead that they're able to slow down for a few months, let us say, to go slow during the transition. So I think one, one thing you can do, I mean, this is uh, almost in the verification area, is, is to make systems that provably will not recruit additional hardware or redesign their hardware so that their resources remain fixed. And I'm, I'm quite happy to sit there for, for several years thinking hard about what the next step would be to take but at that point. it's trivial to copy software. Software is self-replicating and always has been, and that I don't see how you can possibly stop that. I mean, I think it would be great if it went slow, but it's very hard to see how it does go slow, given the huge first mover advantages in getting to super intelligence. So the only scenario I see where it might go slow is where there's only one potential first mover that can then stop and think. So you know, maybe that speaks to creating a, uh, creating a society where you know, AI is restricted and unified, but without multiple movers. Yeah, Dennis, so, so your colleague Shane Legg mentioned that one w thing that could help a lot here is if there's things like this industry partnership and, and a sense of trust and openness between the leaders so that if, it, if there is a point where we want to... Yeah, I do worry about uh, you know, that scenario where you know, I think I, I, I'm, I've got uh, you know, quite high belief in, the, in, in, you know, in human ingenuity to solve these problems given enough time to control problems and other issues. They're very difficult, but I think we can solve them. Um, the problem is, is will there, you know, the coordination problem of making sure there is enough time to slow down at the end and, you know, let Stuart think about this for five years. But what about, you know, he may do that, but what about all the other teams that are reading the papers and are not going to do that while you're thinking? You know, and this is the, this is what I worry about quite a lot because yeah. um, it seems like that coordination problem is quite difficult. But I think as a first step, uh, maybe coordinate, you know, things like partnership and on AI, you know, the most capable teams together at least agree on a set of protocols or safety procedures or things, you know, agree that maybe, it's, you know, we should verify these systems and that is going to take three years and we should um, think about that. I think that would be a good thing. Um, I just want to caveat one thing about uh, uh, slowing and versus fast progress is, you know, it could be that, um, imagine there was a moratorium on uh, AI research for three years, but hardware continued to accelerate as it does now. We could, you know, it's a sort of what Nick's point was, is that um, there could be a massive hardware overhang yeah. or something where then AI actually, many, many, many different approaches to AI, including seed AI, self-improving AI, all these things could be possible. Um, and, you know, maybe a, one person in their garage can do it. And I think that would be a lot more difficult to coordinate um, that kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, whereas, so I think there's some arguments we made where you want to make fast progress when we're at the very hard point of the S-curve, where actually, you know, you need quite large teams, actually quite visible, you know who the other people are, and, you know, in a sense, society can keep tabs on who the, who the major players are and, and what they're up to. Um, we, you know, as opposed to a scenario where, say, in 50 or 100 years' time, um, when, you know, someone, a kid in their, in their garage could create a seed AI or something. Yeah, Bart, one last comment yeah, on this topic. So, so um, since I think that this process will be a very irregular process and some tasks will be far advanced and other tasks will be f quite, quite going quite slow, uh, I'm sort of hoping that when society sees something like uh, fake video creation or where, where, we, where you create a video where you have somebody say, uh, made up things and, and that society will actually realize that there are uh, these new capabilities for the machines and, and we should start taking the problem as a society more seriously before we have full and general AI. We'll use AI to, to detect that. Yeah. So you, um, you, you mentioned some wor the word worry there and, and you, Nick, went a bit farther. You had the word doom written on your slides three times. No wonder there was one star on Amazon and I read it, <laughs> and that it was even in red color. Um, I think it, it's just as important to talk about existential hope and the fantastic upside uh, as downside, and I want to do a lot of that here. But so let's just get some of, the, some of those worries out of the way now and then and return to the, the positive things. So <clears throat> I just want to go through it quickly and uh, give each one of you a chance to just pick one thing that you feel is a challenge that we should overcome and, and then say something about what you feel is the best thing we can do right now to try to mitigate it. Do you want to start, Jan? To mitigate what? To try, think, to mention one thing that you're worried could go wrong and, and tell us about something constructive that we can do now that will reduce that risk. 
Oh, I, I do think that the AI arms races, I see like a lo lot of um, like good, I'm really heartened to see uh, you know, great contacts between open AI and, and deep mind. But I think this is just like a sort of toy model uh, uh, of, of uh, what the world at large uh, might come up with uh, in terms of arms races. And uh, I mean, myself, I've been spending actually increasing amounts of time in Asia um, recently just to kind of uh, try to kind of uh, pull in more people uh, elsewhere, uh, what has been so far just been kind of like a Anglo-American uh, discussion mostly. Uh, so like th this is, I think this is one thing that, that should be done and I'm gonna do it. Well, as someone who's outside this field, I, I think the, um, the challenge I'm really in touch with is how hard it is to take the safety concerns uh, emotionally seriously and, and how, f how hard it is for people in the field to do that as well. I can't tell you how many people outside this room who purport to be experts think the control problem is a total non-issue. It's just, it's flabbergasting to meet these people um, and just, and therefore not worth thinking about. And, and one of the reasons I think is that in, in the one case there's this, there's this illusion that, that the time horizon matters. I, if you feel that this is 50 or 100 years away, that is totally consoling, but there's an implicit assumption there. The, the assumption is that you know how long it will take to build this safely, and that 50 or 100 years is enough time. Um, the other issue is I think most people feel like intelligence is an intrinsic good, and of course we want more of it, and, and it's very easy to be in touch with that assumption because I mean, right now there's a cure for cancer, which we have not discovered, right? If, how galling is that? Uh, and but for more intelligence, but, but for knowing which experiments to run or, or, or how to integrate the data we already have in hand, we would, we would have a, a cure for cancer that was actionable now, unless there was some physical law of the universe that prevented us from curing cancer, which seems unlikely. So it, the, the pain of not having enough intelligence is, is really excruciating when you, when you focus on it. But, um, and I think to, to your, fir your previous question of if doing this quickly becomes an intrinsic good provided we have solved the alignment problems and, and the political problems and, and, the, and the chaos that would, that would follow if we were just, um, if we did it uh, uh, quickly without solving those problems. So I think it's the, the thing that is um, alarming is how ethereal these concerns are, even to those who uh, have no rational argument against them. So Sam, it's, uh, it sounds to me like you're agreeing very strongly with what Shane Legg said, that there is, in some circles, there's still the strong taboo that, you know, don't even think, consider the possibility that we might get AGI because it's just ri absolutely ridiculous. And, and he was arguing that if the sooner we can get rid of this taboo, the, the sooner people can get to work and find all these really helpful solutions and answers that, that we need. So suppose for a moment that um, I came up to you and I said to you, you know, th this idea of superhuman intelligence just sounds absolutely ridiculous. It sounds completely nuts. And by the way, I've never seen your TED talk. <laughs> you know, and we're in an elevator. You have only 30 seconds to persuade me to take this more seriously. What would you say? And what, a lot of people who are here will have this exact conversation with, with colleagues and others in the uh, well, well, there are, there are very few assumptions you need to make to take this seriously, intellectually. Again, the, the emotional part is a, is a separate piece. But um, if you assume that intelligence is just uh, on some level the product of information processing in a physical system, and there are very few people who dispute that and who are scientifically literate at this point, um, uh, and you assume that we will continue to improve our information processing systems unless something terrible happens to us to prevent that, uh, and that seems like a very safe assumption, then it is just a matter of time before we instantiate something that is human level and beyond in, in our computers. And um, again, the time horizon is only consoling uh, on the assumption that we know we have enough time to solve the, the alignment problems and the political problems that we get. I mean, the other thing that's, that's humbling here that, that, that Ray brought up at one point is that even if we were handed a perfectly ben benign, well-behaved AI, just from God, you know, we're given a perfect oracle, we're given a perfect inventor of, of 
of good technology. Uh, given our current political and, and economic atmosphere, we w that would produce total chaos. We just have not, we don't have the, the, the ethical or political will to share the wealth. We don't have the, um, uh, the political integration to deal with the, you know, the, the, this thing being given to Silicon Valley and not being given at the same moment to China or Iran. So there's just, it, it's, it's, it's uh, alarming that the, the best case scenario currently, uh, you know, basically just ripping out 80% of, of Nick's book uh, because we've solved all those problems is still a, a terrifying one. And so clearly that's a near-term mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing that we have to solve. Thank you, Sam. So Demis, do you want to tell us about one thing that you feel is a challenge and, and, and say something about what we should focus on now yeah, I, mean, I, th I think it. I think it's you know I agree with 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 both statements already said that uh, so I think the coordination problem is one thing where you know we want to we want to avoid this sort of harmful race to the finish where um, you know corner cutting starts happening and things like safety are, are, are easy things to, to you know will get will the things will get cut because obviously they don't necessarily directly contribute to AI capability in fact they may hold it back a bit um, by making a safe AI so I think that's a, that's going to be a big issue on a global scale. Um, and it seems like uh, that's going to be a hard problem uh, when, it, when you're talking about national governments and things. Um, and I think also, you know, we haven't thought enough about the whole governance scenario of how do we want, uh, 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 you know, those AIs to be out in the world, how many of them and how will they, you know, who will set their goals, all these kinds of things, I think needs a lot more thought, um, you know, it, 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 once we've already solved the technical problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful that you're not just saying these things, but actually doing these things, since you played a leading role in setting up the partnership on AI here, which goes exactly in the direction of what you're advocating here. So if you want to pass it off, off to Nick? I'm sure there's nothing at all you're worried about, right? So no, tell no, us no. about one concrete, useful thing you would like to see us so focus on. I agree on with now. that. I mean, so, so fun technical work, bringing top talent to work on these technical issues, uh, build these collaborations, build a community, build a trust. Um, work some more on figuring out attractive solutions to the governance solutions that could work, but don't rush to implement the first idea you have, but first trial them out a little bit more. So yeah, I, I think a lot about consciousness. So uh, I was really struck by the, uh, the sentience caution in my list of principles here that said, uh, avoid, overly, avoid, avoid strong assumptions about the distribution of consciousness in AIs, which I take it entails avoid assuming that any human level or superhuman level AGI is gonna be conscious. Uh, for me, that raises the possibility of a massive failure mode in the, uh, in the future. The possibility that we create human or superhuman level AGI and we've got a world populated by superhuman level AGIs, none of whom is conscious. And that would be a world, could potentially be a world of great intelligence, no consciousness, no <laughs> subjective experience at all. Now, I think many, many people, and, um, the wide variety of views take the view that basically subjective experience or consciousness is required in order to have any meaning or value in your life at all. So therefore a world without consciousness could not possibly be a positive outcome. Maybe it wouldn't be a terribly negative outcome. It would just be a zero outcome and among the worst possible outcomes. So I worry about avoiding that outcome. Now as a matter of fact, I'm fairly optimistic about the possibilities that AIs of various kinds will be conscious. But insofar as this community is making that assumption, I think it's then it's important to actually think about the question of in creating AGIs, are we actually creating <laughs> conscious beings? I think one thing that we ought to at least consider doing there is making, given that we don't understand consciousness, we don't have a complete theory of consciousness, maybe we can be most confident about consciousness when it's similar to the cases, the case we know about the best, namely human, so uh, what human I consciousness. So therefore, there's maybe an imperative to create human-like AGI in order that we can be maximally confident that there's gonna be consciousness. So what I hear you say is, if, is that when you have a nightmare about the zombie or cop apocalypse, yeah. you, you're not thinking about some silly Terminator movie, but you're thinking about this problem. We, we create, we upload ourselves, do all these wonderful things, but we, <laughs> there's no one home. Is that fair to say? I mean, this is a different kind of existential risk. One kind of existential risk is there's no humans, there's, there's AIs. And some people might say, well, that's okay, there are our, uh, there are our successes. Yeah. A much worse existential risk is there, is no, there are no conscious beings in our future. So, well, so I'll make a confession. So, so Shane Legg mentioned that there's been this strong taboo about talking about um, the possibility of intelligence getting very advanced. It's clearly also been a strong taboo for a long time to mention the C word. 
In fact, before the, the conference, when we got all these responses on the first round of the principles, guess which one was ranked last? It got huge amounts of, of minus one ratings. That was the one with conscience. <coughs> so we changed it to It was terribly stated. And stated it better, and then it got stated it's still better at lunch, and it's still rated last. So that's what, even though, even though I personally share your interest in this a lot. 88% of people agreed to the, yeah, uh, to the sentience caution. But not 90, so that one also fell off the list here. So maybe that's another taboo. You can personally help us shatter so people think about that question more. Uh, Ray, anything yeah, you're well, concerned about? And, uh, any this advice wasn't what I was going to say, but just to respond, uh, a converse concern is we create AGIs Everybody assumes that, of course, it's just a machine, and therefore it's not conscious, but actually it is suffering, but we don't look out for its conscious subjective experience because we are making the wrong assumption. But what, what I did want to say was uh, there are three overlapping revolutions that people talk about, GNR, genetics, biotech, nanotechnology, and robotics, which is AI. And there, be, there are uh, proposals, uh, there was the CLMR conferences done here decades ago for biotech that have worked fairly well. Uh, there are similar proposals for nanotechnology. Uh, there's a difference with AI in that there really isn't a, a foolproof technical solution to this. You can have uh, technical uh, controls on, say, nanotechnology. One of the guidelines is it shouldn't be self-replicating. It's not really realistic because it, it can't scale to meaningful quantities without being self-replicating. But you can imagine uh, technical protections. Uh, if you have an AI that's more intelligent than you and it's out for your destruction or it's out for the world's destruction and, and there's no other AI that's superior to it, uh, that's a bad situation. So that that's the specter. And Partly this is amplified by our observation of what we as humans, the most intelligent species on the planet, have done to other species. If we look at how we treat animals, uh, people you know, are very fr like their dogs and, and pets, but uh, if you look at factory farming, uh, we're not uh, very benign to uh, species that are less intelligent than us. That, that uh, gender engenders a lot of the concern we see that if there's a, a new ent type of entity that's more intelligent than us, it's going to treat us like we've treated other species. So that's the concern. I, you know, I do think what we're doing at this conference is appropriate. I, I wanted to mention that uh, I think we should publish these guidelines the way the SLMR guidelines in biotech were published decades ago. Uh, and then people can, and people can, you can have an opt-in, opt-out, but I think we should actually say we had this conference and the AI leadership community you know, has come up with these guidelines and people can respond to them and debate them and then maybe at the next conference we'll revise them. The Silomar Biotech uh, guidelines have been revised many times. Uh, but I would advocate we actually uh, take a stand and, and put forth uh, these guidelines and then let the whole community uh, at large uh, debate them uh, and have them be, have them uh, guide our research. It's actually worked quite well in biotech. Bart? Okay, yeah, um, so let me give a, a little different perspective. So uh, so one concern I, I have at a high level is, is these machines become really smart or, or even in certain areas, can humans still understand what the decisions they de that they suggest or that they make? Uh, and I work in, in the field of automated reasoning where we have you know, significant advance the last two decades going from problems with a few hundred variables to problems of millions of variables being solved now quite routinely. Um, and there was a sense in the community, well, you know, that we're getting answers from these, from these reasoning engines, uh, mostly hardware, software fabrication uh, problems, but we cannot, humans can no longer understand these answers. Uh, in the last few years, people have actually discovered that you, you can use the machine to generate uh, explanations for their <laughs> answers that are, again, human understandable. So I, I see sort of a glimmer of hope that maybe even if we are, have lost much less intelligence, we may be able to understand solutions that machines find for us, and we could not find these solutions, but they may be able to provide explanations that are accessible to us. So that's a little positive note. 
Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so there are two things that keep me awake at night, uh, other than email. Um, <laughs> so one is uh, the problem of misuse and bad actors. Uh, you know, to take uh, an analogy, it's, it's as if we were building nuclear weapons and then delivering them by email to everybody on the planet and saying, here's a toy, you know, do what you want. Um, how do we counter that? Uh, I have to say, I don't really have uh, a good solution. I think one of the things we have to do uh, is to make, uh, to make designs for safe AI very clear and simple uh, and sort of make it unthinkable to do anything other than that, right? Just like it's unthinkable to have a program with an infinite loop that produces a spinning pizza of death on your, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, it's unthinkable to have a buffer overflow that allows your, your uh, software to be hacked into. Um, the other thing that keeps me awake is um, actually the, the possibility that success uh, would lead to, you know, sort of AI as a helicopter parent for the human race that would sort of ossify and gradually enfeeble us. Uh, so then there would, be, there would be no point at which it was obvious to us that this was happening. Um, and I think the mitigation which you asked for to look on the bright side uh, is that uh, in some sense the, the, the meta value of uh, human evolvability, right, the, free, the freedom to change the future uh, is something that the AI uh, needs to adopt. Uh, and in some sense that would result eventually in the AI receding into the background and saying, okay, now you know, I've got you through your adolescence uh, now it's time for the human race to grow up, now that we have the capabilities to eliminate scarcity, to eliminate needless conflict and, and coordination failures and, and all those things that we suffer from right now. Uh, so I could imagine a distant future where in fact AI is uh, perhaps even less visible than it is today. Great. Finally, uh, you, Elon, uh, as far as I know, never ever expressed any concerns about uh, AI, right? I'm just wondering if you've... It'll be fine. <laughs> does, if there is any, any uh, <laughs> yeah, challenge, concerns you, in particular, any concerns that you, where you see there's a very clear thing we should be doing now that, that are going to help? Uh, well, I, I'm trying to think of like, <clears throat> you know, what, what, what is an actual good future? What does that actually look like? Um, or at least bad or, I don't know how you want to characterize it. Um, uh, because it, it, um, the point that was made earlier, I think maybe by, maybe by Sam and, and, and maybe by others, that it, we're headed towards either superintelligence or civilization ending. Those are those like the two things that are like it, that, that'll happen. Intelligence will keep advancing. The only thing that would prevent it from advancing is the, is something that puts civilization into stasis or destroys civilization. So. Then we have to figure out what is a world that would we would like to be in, where there is this um, uh, digital superintelligence. Um, I think the uh, and, then, and then another point that I think is really important to appreciate is that um, we are all of us already are cyborgs. Um, so you have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your your phone and your computer and all your applications. You are already superhuman. But by far, you have more, more power, more capability than the President of the United States had you know, 30 years ago. Um, if you have an internet link, uh, you, you have an oracle of wisdom, you can communicate to millions of people, you can communicate to the rest of Earth instantly. Um, I mean, these are magical powers uh, that didn't exist not that long ago. So everyone is already superhuman uh, and a cyborg. Um, the limitation is one of bandwidth. So we're, we're bandwidth constrained, particularly on output. Uh, so uh, our input is much better, but our output is extremely slow. Um, you know, if you want to be generous, you could say maybe it's a few hundred bits per second or a kilobit or something like that output. Um, but be, you know, the way we, we output is like we have our little meat sticks <laughs> <laughs> that we move very slowly <laughs> and, and push buttons or tap, tap a little screen, uh, and, and that's just extremely slow. Um, and, you know, compare that to a computer which can communicate at the terabit level. Very big orders of magnitude differences. 
the, our input is much better because of vision. Um, but even that could be enhanced significantly. I think, I think the, the, the two things that are needed for, mo for a, good, a future that we would look at and conclude is good, most likely, is we, we have to solve that bandwidth constraint um, with, a, with a direct neural interface. I think a high bandwidth interface to the cortex. Um, so that we can have a digital tertiary layer that's more, fu more fully symbiotic with, uh, with the rest of us. Like we've got, we've got the cortex and the limbic system which seem to work together pretty well. They've got good bandwidth, whereas the bandwidth to our digital tertiary layer is, is weak. Um, so, so I think if, if we can solve that bandwidth issue um, and then um, AI can be widely available. The, AI, the, the analogy to a nuclear bomb is not exactly correct. It, it's, it's, not, it's not as though it's gonna explode and create a mushroom cloud. Um, it, it, it's more like if, if, if there were just a few people that had it, they, they would be able to be, be essentially dic dictators of Earth or, or, or you know, whoever acquired it and, and, and if, if it was limited to a small number of people they were, and it was ultra smart, they, were, they would have dominion over Earth. So I think it's extremely important that it be widespread and that we solve the bandwidth uh, issue. And if we do those things, then, then it will be tied to our consciousness, tied to our will, um, tied to the sum of individual human will, um, and, and everyone would have it. So it would be sort of still uh, a relatively even playing field. In fact, it would be probably more egalitarian than today. Great, thank you so much. That's in fact the perfect segue into the last question I wanna ask you before we open it up to everybody. Something I have really missed in the discussion about really advanced intelligence beyond human is more thought about the upside. We have so much talk about existential risk and um, not just in the academic context, but just flip on, uh, your TV, check out Netflix. What do you see there in, in these scientific visions of the future? It's almost always dystopias, right? For some reason, fear gives more clicks than, than positive visions. But um, if I have a student coming into my office at MIT asking for career advice, the first thing I'm gonna ask, is, ask her is, you know, how do you, where will you wanna be in 20 years? And if she just says, well, maybe I'll get cancer. <laughs> maybe I'll get run over by a bus, you know. That's a terrible way to think about career planning. Right? I want her to be on fire and say, you know, my vision is I want to do this. And here are the things that could go wrong. And then you can plan out how to avoid those problems and get it. I would love to see more discussion about the upsides, the futures we're really excited about. So we can not just <coughs> try to avoid pr problems for the sake of avoiding problems, but to get to something that we're all really on fire about. So to, to start off, I'll, I'll just, tell you something that makes me really excited about advanced artificial intelligence. Everything I love about civilization is a product of intelligence. You know, the, um, if we for some reason were to say, well, you know, I'm scared about this technology thing, ooh, let's just press pause on it forever. There's no interesting question about if we're gonna have human extinction. The question is just when, you know, is it gonna be a super volcano, is it gonna be the next dinosaur class, killing class asteroid? You know, the last one happened 60 million years ago, so how long is it gonna be? Pretty horrible future to just sit and wonder when, the, when, when we're gonna get taken out here without the technology, when we know that we totally have the brain power to solve all these problems if we, if we proceed forward and develop technology. So this, that was just um, my, one thing that makes me very excited about moving forward rather than pressing pause. I want to just ask the same question to all of you guys in turn. So tell us just pretty briefly about something that you are really excited about, some future vision you imagine with, with very advanced artificial intelligence that you're really excited about, that you would like to see. Jan. So I want to be careful uh, when I you know, if, uh, imagine concrete uh, fruits of, of AGI. Like on a meta level, I think uh, sort of or as a first approximation, I think we should just maximize the amount of fun and minimize the amount of suffering. 
I think Eliezer has uh, written a, a sequence called uh, uh, Fun Theory, uh, uh, where he points out that people have been horrible uh, imagining uh, and very kind of unimaginative imagining paradises of various sorts. They're just like really boring places, actually, when you think about them. Uh, I think Eddie Izzard has this uh, sketch where he says, like, it was hard to spend like one weekend with my relatives. Like, imagine spending like eternity with your dead relatives. Uh, but uh, uh, so like, I think uh, we should like, kind of be concerned about side effects and, and try to kind of capture dynamics of improvement uh, and, and basically go from there. Make sure that we kind of adjust the trajectory as we get smarter and, uh, and more grown together. Great. Thank you, Jan. Sam, what do you get excited about? Well, strangely, the, what excites me is just really just abuts the the parts that scare me the most. I, I think what is nice about this conversation, uh, in particular about the alignment problem, is that it's forcing us to realize that there are better and worse answers to questions of human value. And as someone said, uh, perhaps at this last meeting in Puerto Rico, that we have we really we really have to do philosophy on a deadline, and we have to we have to admit to ourselves that there are better and worse an answers, and we have to converge on the better ones, and what would excite me about actually the birth of super intelligent AI, one of the things, apart from solving obvious problems like curing disease and energy uh, issues and all the rest, but is it perhaps differs a little bit with what uh, Stuart said. I, I'm not so worried about uh, idiocracy or all of us just um, uh, uh, losing our way as apes and um, uh, uh, living unproductive lives in dialogue with these these oracles, uh, I think actually I would want a a truly value aligned superintelligence to incrementally show us not 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 merely conserve what we want, but show us what we should want to get to keep improving our values so that we can we can navigate in the space of all possible experiences and converge on on better and better ones. Thank you, Sam. What about you, Demis? So, I mean, obviously, this is why I spent my whole career working on this, is that if I think if we do this right, it's going to be the greatest thing ever to happen to humanity and in some ways, I think, unlock our full potential. I mean, I've talked a lot about in all my talks about using it as a tool to help us make science and medical breakthroughs faster. That's, I think that's an obvious one. But sort of taking that longer term, one reason I got so into AI is that, um, like probably many of you in this room, you know, I'm interested in the biggest questions of why we're here, understanding our mind, what is consciousness, What's the nature of the universe? What's our purpose? And if we're going to try and really grapple with any of those questions, I think we're going to need something like AI, perhaps with ourselves enhanced as well. To uh, and I think w you know, in that future world, we'll have a chance to actually find out about some of these really deep questions. Um, you know, in the same way we're finding out with AlphaGo just about Go, but what if we could do that with all of science and physics and 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 you know, the biggest questions in the universe? And uh, I think, you know, that's going to be the most exhilarating journey of all to find that out. Um, you know, to just caveat on a few other things that people commented on is, you know, in terms of like, you know, us as the most intelligent beings on the planet right now and treating animals badly and these sorts of things. I think if you think about it, though, you know, let's take, you know, I don't know, tigers or something in India. They have huge ranges and those people are very poor and they, they, they're very resource poor. But if they had abundant resources, I don't think they're intentionally trying to kill off these tigers. Or, I mean, some, in some cases they are, but often it's just because they need the land for their cattle. And, and that's this, the tiger needs, you know, whatever number of kiloma square kilometers to live, one tiger. And it's just difficult with the number of people that are there. So I think if we solve the kind of abundance and scarcity problem, um, then I think that opens up, uh, you know, I think a lot of conflicts both, you know, between humans as well are to do with resource scarcity at the, at the heart of it. So I see, uh, you know, if we can solve a lot of these problems, I can see a much better future. Great. So Nick, you, you pointed out that the, w the, the upside part of your book was a little bit shorter, so now you have a chance to add something positive. What are you excited about? Well, there are really two sides to that. So one is getting rid of a lot of the negatives, that, like the compassionate use to cure diseases and all, all other kinds of horrible miseries that exist on the planet today. So that is a large chunk of the potential. But then beyond that, if one really wants to see realistically what the positive things are that could be developed, I think one has to think outside the constraints of our current human biological nature that 
it's unrealistic to imagine a trajectory stretching hundreds of thousands of years into the future. We have super intelligence, we have material abundance, and yet we are still these bipedal uh, organisms with three pounds um, of gray cheesy matter with a fixed set of emotional sensitivities and a hedonic set point that is kind of okay-ish for most people. But if, if you get, you know, something really good happens, it, it lasts a short time and then you're back to the baseline. I think all of these basic parameters that sort of define the human game today I think become up for grabs in this future. And it opens up this much vaster space of post-human modes of being, uh, some of which I think could be um, wonderful lit literally beyond our ability to imagine in, in terms of the mental states, types of activities, the understanding, the ways of relating. Um, so I don't think we need a detailed blueprint for utopia now. What we need is to get ourselves in a position later on where we can have the ability to use this to realize the values that come into view when, once we take mm -hmm. steps forward. Thank you, Nick. What about you, David? Oh, I'm excited about the possibilities for AI making us humans smarter. I mean, some of it is selfish. Uh, you know, I turned 50 last year, my brain is gradually becoming slower and older and, and dumber, but I'm not sure that I am, and that's partly because, you know, well, the augmented intelligence technology we're using, um, you know, smartphones and the internet and so on are giving me all kinds of capacities, extended capacities that I didn't have before. And I'm really looking forward to AI helping with, uh, with that. You know, in 10 years or so, once everyone is wearing augmented reality glasses with deep learning built into it, then I'm really gonna, you know, I'm really gonna need that around, uh, around uh, 60. And if you guys really get on the case, and by, you know, by the time I'm 70 or so, we've got, uh, you know, AI, real genuine AI or AI modules out there which could somehow come to be integrated with my, uh, my, my, my brain processes or maybe eventually we get to upload um, our entire brains onto AI, then there's a, there's a way potentially to get, uh, you know, smarter, more intelligent forever. And this is not just selfish, although, you know, that, I can't say that doesn't motivate me. But, um, <laughs> you know, Demis talked about the AI scientist. I also like to think about the AI philosopher. You know, the problems of philosophy are really hard, and many people have speculated that we humans are just too dumb to solve, um, to solve some of them. But once we've actually got AIs on the scene, maybe AI enhanced humans, and maybe we're going to be able to cross those, uh, cross those thresholds where, where the AI enhanced humans, or maybe just the AGIs, end up solving some of those hard problems of philosophy for once and for all. So. Great, Ray, you have been a true pioneer in articulating positive visions of the future in your writings. So if you would pick the one that you're most excited about now, what would that so be? Go, imagine going back 10,000 years and asking uh, quintessential caveman and woman, gee, what, <coughs> what is a beneficial future? What would you like to see? And they would say, well, I'd like uh, this fire to stop going out, and I'd like a bigger boulder to prevent the animals from getting in the cave. Anything else? Well, no, I think that would be pretty perfect. Uh, well, don't, don't you want a better website and apps and uh, search engines? And uh, Imagine going back two million years ago and talking to primates, if you could do that, and saying, isn't it great? The frontal cortex is coming and you can have additional neocortex and higher hierarchy. And they say, well, what's the point of that? And they say, well, you'll have music and, and humor. And their answer would be, what's music? What's, what's humor? <laughs> Uh, so, they couldn't imagine concepts that they couldn't imagine. And by analogy, I think we will have new phenomena that are as profound as music and humor. We could call it more profound music and, and will be funnier, but uh, I think it'll be as profound as, as these great leaps that evolution has brought us because we will become profoundly smarter and you know, if, if music and uh, humor are up here and we go to even higher levels of the neocortex, uh, we're going to have more profound ways of expressing ourselves. And once we have that, we would not want to go back. What about you, Bart? <laughs> well, I, I pretty much agree with that. We, we can't really predict much in advance what, what we would like to have. For myself personally, I, I see the developments in mathematics and discovering and, and science and discovery. And computers are just the... the, the uh, the hybrids of, of human computers there uh, is quite incredible and makes the field, makes what we do much more exciting. So I think that will be the, in the near future the first thing. 
Great, and what about you, Stuart? Uh, well, so like um, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, I think that for many of us, uh, and probably like the caveman, that, um, uh, that for many of us, life is pretty amazing. Um, and for many more of us, it isn't. Uh, and I think the, the best thing that AI can do, the big upside, is actually to, to fix the latter problem. Um, I mean, I, I love Nick's uh, feeling that there are higher states of being that are, that are so far above our, our current pretty good um, that, uh, that that balances out uh, all the, the pretty bad um, that a lot of people are suffering. But I, I really think the, the emphasis should be on the pretty bad and fixing it. Uh, and eliminating, so Demis was reading my notes apparently uh, <laughs> from across the room, uh, but eliminating the scarcity ba basically eliminates the need for people to act uh, in a zero sum fashion uh, where they can only get by by making it less possible for someone else to get by. And I think that's the source of a lot of the, uh, the nastiness uh, that Jeffrey mentioned earlier. So um, I think that would be my, uh, my main upside. Um, and uh, not having to read so much email. That would be the second. <laughs> and uh, for you, Elon, you've never articulated any, op any visionary ideas about the future, as far as I know, either. D what about now? <laughs> I, I think I just, you know, um, I haven't have thought about this a lot. And I think it just really just comes down to um, the two things. And it's, it's the solving the, the machine brain bandwidth constraint, and democratization of AI. I think if we have those two things, the future will be good. Um, there's a great quote by Lord Acton, which is that you know, uh, 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 freedom consists of the dist distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. Um, and I think as long as we have, as long as, long as AI, AI power is, like anyone can get it if they want it, um, and you know, we, we, we've got something faster than meat sticks to communicate with, uh, then I think the future will be good. Fantastic. Be so let's get in. I know your caffeine levels are dropping dangerously low, and we also have another panel after this, which is going to be really exciting to listen to. So let's do a, just a few quick questions. Make sure that they are actually questions. And... Uh, <laughs> say your name and also say who, pick one person on the panel and address it just to them, okay? Uh, Joshua? Joshua Benjo, Montreal. Joshua Benjo, Montreal. Um, and it's for Jan. Uh, I found your, uh, your, your presentation very inspiring. And one question I have is uh, related to the question of uh, eliciting preference and, and values from, from people. Uh, do you think this, this line of uh, investigation could uh, lead to better democracy, better society, uh, more direct democracy? And, and, you know, what do you think about this direction to deal with the issue of misuse and, and, and things like that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, like, I mean, one code name for this even could be like Democracy 2.0 or U UN 2.0 or something like that. So, and, and as I mentioned in my presentation, like just, uh, I mean, a lot of people today basically want to make the world better, uh, but it's kind of hard to distinguish them from people who say they want to make, make the world better. So if there was actually kind of like a very easy measuring, uh, like a metric uh, that, that basically would uh, work as a well, selling point, focal point, uh, then I think that would be super helpful. Uh, and, and yeah, like democracy, was invented like hundreds of years ago. So, so and uh, clearly, we have advanced as a civilization, and uh, we have better knowledge about how to aggregate aggregate preferences. And Nicholas Bergruen over there. Thank you, Max. Uh, Nicholas Bergruen. So, I have a very um, almost naive question. This is a very well-meaning group um, in terms of, let's say, intentions. But who? Who's sort of looking at who else is doing potentially AGI? It could be well beyond this group. It could be in China. It could be any place. And what happens? Because we've talked about how powerful AGI is. And if uh, Elon is correct, if it's distributed fairly, uh, fine. But uh, if it isn't, uh, is there a way to monitor today 
or in a year or in 10 years, because once it's out, it'll be fast. Um, who is monitoring it? Who, who, who has a tab on it? Because this is self-selected, but beyond. Uh, Elon or Demis, does either one of you want to take a swing at this? Um, well, I think this is sort of relates to my point I said earlier about uh, trying to um, build AI at the hard part of the S-curve. So, which I think is where we sort of are at the moment, um, as far as we can tell, because, um, you know, it's not easy to make this kind of progress. So, you need, you need quite a lot of people who are quite smart, and that community is pretty small still, even though it's getting rapidly bigger at places like NIPS. Um, and so, and most people know each other. So, this is pretty representative of everyone in the West, at least. Obviously, it's harder to know what's happening in China or in, in, in Russia, maybe. But, um, you know, I think that you need quite a large footprint of resources, you know, people and very smart people and <coughs> lots of compute and so on. So I think um, that narrows down the scope of the number of groups who can do that and it also means that they're more visible. So, um, you know, I think certainly in the West, I think most people on here, someone in, these, in this room will have contact with somebody who's in those groups who are capable of, um, you know, making meaningful progress towards AGI. It's harder to know in, in, in the East and, and further apart, but we should try and make links to those, you know, nat Chinese National Academy of Sciences and so on to find out more. Um, but, you know, that may change in the future. I think that's the current state of it. Great. It's, uh, the bad news is it's getting late in the day and we only have time for one more question. But the good news is there's a coffee break right after this, so you can ask all your questions if you swarm the, the panel. And the last question goes to you, Eric. Do you want to stand up? Eric Brynjolfsson, MIT. Um, I'm going to pick up on the thing that Elon said at the end about um, democratizing the, the outcome and tie it back to the panel yesterday where, where uh, Reid Hoffman talked about people caring a lot about not just absolute income but relative income and wanted to get the, the panelists reactions to the thoughts about whether or not AI had tendencies towards winner take all effects, that there's a tendency for its concentration, um, that whoever's ahead can pull further ahead or whether there's uh, potential for more widespread democratic access to it or, or and, and what kinds of mechanisms we can put in place if we want to have the uh, uh, widely shared prosperity uh, that Elon suggested. Elon, do you want to take that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I, I have to say that when, you know, when, when, when something is a, a danger to the public, then the, there needs to be some I hate to say it, government agency, like regulators. Like I'm not the biggest fan of regulators, like it's a bit of a buzzkill, um, you know. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is, like we've got regulators in, um, you know, the aircraft industry, car industry, deal with them all the time, uh, with drugs, food, um, you know, and, and anything that's sort of a public risk. Um, I mean, I think this has to fall into the category of a public risk, um, and. Um, you know, so I think I think that like this the right, the right thing to do, and I think it will happen. The question is whether the government reaction speed matches the adva advancement speed of AI. Um, governments react slowly, and uh, uh, governments move slowly, and they tend to be reactive as opposed to proactive. Um, and um, but you can, you can look at these other industries and say like, does anybody really want the FAA to go away? You know, it's like people could just be a free for all for aircraft. Like probably not. You know, like there's a reason it's there. <laughs> or, or just people can just do any kind of drugs and, you know, maybe they work, maybe they don't. You know, we have that in supplements, like, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but, but I think, like, on balance, FDA is good. Um, so I think, I think we, we probably need some kind of regulatory authority. And I, I think it's, like, the, the, the rebuttal to that is, like, well, people will just, like, move to freaking Costa Rica or something. That's not true. Okay, like we don't see Boeing moving to Costa Rica or to, you know, Venezuela or wherever it's like free and loose. Um, the, uh, to Demis's point, the, the AI is overwhelmingly likely to be developed where there is a concentration of AI research talent. Um, and that happens to be in a few places in the world. Um, you know, it's, uh, Silicon Valley, London, you know, Boston, a few, sort of few other, few other places, but really just like a few places that really 
regulators could, could reasonably access. Um, and I want to be clear, it's not because I love regulators, okay? <laughs> they're pain in the neck, but they're necessary if, to preserve the public good at times. All right, on that note, let's thank the panel for a fascinating discussion. <laughs> <laughs>